So today, I want to answer a very critical question that so many of us have. So many of us think about our loved ones. We think about sons and daughters, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, co-workers, neighbors, friends, who if they were left behind, if the rapture, if the harpazo took place this evening and they were left behind, can they be saved during the tribulation? I want to answer that question carefully, pastorally, and most of all, biblically today. And we are going to answer that. I want to answer the question that has caused so much confusion in, among people studying the Bible. And so many people cannot figure out who these 144,000 sealed are. The Jehovah's Witness has built a whole erroneous doctrine on it. And so many people get confused. By God's grace, we're going to bring clarity to that issue today. But let's start with verse number one. And Caleb, it says that the, he, uh, there's a phrase. Read verse one for me again that I want you to not miss in Revelation. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Now again, if you pay attention... As you read the book, you're going to encounter a phrase that keeps saying, after this. In the Greek, that's metatauta. That is such an important phrase because every time that John says metatauta, every time he says after this, that means a transition has taken place. Something big is just about to happen and something big has just happened. And John says, after this, what's he saying? After the succession of these uh, sealed judgments of chapter 6. Remember we said last week in chapter 6, the last verse, it asked a question. If this is the wrath of the Lamb, and make no mistake, the judgments upon the earth during the great tribulation, it is not judgments from Satan. It is not judgments from sinners. They are judgments from Almighty God. The Bible calls them the wrath of the Lamb. And it's vital that you and I understand that. And if the wrath of the Lamb is coming upon the earth, then the Bible asks this question then who can stand? And chapter 7 is the answer to that question who? can stand. Last Sunday, after we studied the catastrophic events that's going to come on the earth, Sadie, we went to dinner or went to lunch, and she asked me a question going home. She said, if we're going to watch these events from heaven, like you say, and I thought, well, it's not me, it's what the Bible says, but whatever. (laughs) But she said, "And, and again, I'll reinforce that next week in chapter 8 as the trumpet judgments blast listen what the bible says we are going to be so stunned by the wrath of the lamb listen what the bible says there'll be silence in heaven for half an hour you go back and you read revelation and watch every single time You you study the sight passages, what John saw. But listen, study the sound passages, what he heard. Like thunder. Like peals of thunder. Like mighty roars of water. Everything in heaven is loud, according to John. But we are so stunned by the events of the earth. The Bible says there'll be silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Now... Sadie asked this question, if we are watching from the balconies of heaven and we see this catastrophe upon the earth and yet God has wiped away tears in heaven, she said, here's what I don't understand. Will our hearts go out to the ones left behind? Will we weep for our lost loved ones? Will we be concerned about the souls on the earth? Friends, this is, this is my point today. I want to answer the vital question, can people be saved during the tribulation? And here is going to be my point. I want to show you, even in God's 
anger, even in his wrath, even on the greatest judgments. Listen, the Bible says of the, uh, of the seven-year tribulation, Jesus himself said that there's never been a time like it in human history, nor will there ever be another time like it. And Jesus said that if those days were not shortened, that there would be no flesh saved. It is going to be an unbelievably, unbelievable time of wrath. And here is my point. The the purpose of the 144,000 sealed is because God, even in his wrath, has unbelievable mercy. And even during the tribulation, God is going to be proclaiming repentance to the world. And he's going to do it through these 144,000 evangelists. Can people be saved during the tribulation? Today I'm going to argue yes. And I'm going to show you with scripture why some say they won't and why I believe in this scripture we see that they are. Now, as we go into this, notice what is happening. I believe the events that are taking place are rapid fire successions. Just like labor pains coming upon a birth... Things are happening very quick. And notice what it says. The four angels were ready to hold back the winds of the earth. Now, I I can't get all deep into this because next week, I think I'm more excited about next week than I've been about any part of our study so far. I'm going to show you next week with great detail why I believe the religion of the earth is going to be climate change. Are we not seeing the world get positioned for that right now? And I'm going to show you how the trumpet judgments are judgment upon climate change. It's judgment upon people who worship the earth. Who worship creation rather than worshiping the creator. And before this judgment comes, can you imagine what it would do to our climate if there were no wind on the earth? Can you imagine the effects on the climate if there were no wind? And we're going to see that God's going to judge climate change. Next week, I'm going to show you how things are changing so fast. I can't get into it right now. So I'm, but I want to show you even banks like Bank of America has introduced a new policy that if a business doesn't have the right carbon footprint, they won't loan them money. If businesses don't have the right SEG score, they won't get loans. I'm telling you, they're getting ready. You won't believe the clampdown that's about to come. And it's all in the name of climate change. And the Bible predicts every bit of it. But that's next week. So John is watching. Judgment is about to fall. But then he hears the angel, verse 2, says, Whoa, don't harm the earth until we have sealed the servants of God. Now, who are these servants? If you're going to take notes today, let me help you in something in interpreting the Bible. So people get all confused about these 144,000. Some say it's this group. Some say it's that group. Let me tell you a trick when interpreting the Bible. And you should write this down. God says what he means. And God means what he says. You hear me? God says what he means. And he means what he says. When the Bible says sons of the Israelites, who do you think that refers to? The Jews. Now, again, Scripture speaks of a time of the Gentiles. That's Romans chapter 11. And the Bible lays all this out. You should read You should read Romans 11 to understand God's heart and God's plan and what God expects our attitude to be toward Israel. The Bible tells us crystal clear. It tells us how we ought to pray. It tells us how we ought to think. It tells us how we ought to feel concerning the Jewish people. And see, the Bible says that during the time of the Gentiles, the Jews are partially blinded. What does that mean? That means from the day of Pentecost till the rapture of the church, 
Revelation 4, 1, the harpazo. God right now is focused on the Gentile world. He is saving his, what did we call it? The Gentile bride. Remember Ruth who was a Gentile and Boaz who was the kinsman redeemer? And God is preparing for the marriage supper of the Lamb when Christ will marry the church, the bride. Who is the Gentile bride? Ruth. But once the harpazo, the rapture, takes place, then God shifts his focus back to Israel. And here is my point. Say amen if you're with me right now. Don't miss this. Our brothers and our sisters in the Lord who believe in what's called replacement theology or replacement covenant, those who would take Israel... And replace Israel with the church. Let me tell you why that's so wrong. Because God has made an everlasting and a permanent and an eternal covenant with Israel. They have always been God's people and they always will be God's people. Not because of them but because of God and because of his faithfulness. And see, our brothers and sisters who would replace Israel with the church, they unknowingly, they are making God to be a liar. Because if the church replaces Israel, then what happens to God's eternal covenant with Israel? Remember what we said. God has distinctive sets of people. And as we see in this chapter, we're going to see Israel. We're going to see the 24 elders, who is the New Testament church. We're going to see the angels. We're going to see the four living creatures. You can't mix up these groups. They are, they are distinctive groups. Where am I at, Caleb? Verse 3. No, I don't know, I, I don't know where I'm at. Verse 9, I believe. Oh, we're after already the, at verse 9. 144,000. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what's the point? So what's the point? Here is my point. The 144,000, and we're going to peek into chapter 14 today to see the true purpose of them. But for right now, understand this. Even in the darkest days of wrath, God's going to have lights in the world. And they're called the 144,000 sealed Jews. God is going to mark his people. God is going to seal his... I'm going to talk about that in just a moment when we get to chapter 14. God is literally going to seal them on their foreheads. God's going to protect them through the entirety of the tribulation. And they are going to herald and they're going to proclaim and they're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the globe. Now we come to this question. And what's their purpose? God's fulfilling his promise to Israel. God's shifting his focus back to Israel. Why? Because the Gentile church is raptured. The Gentile church is in heaven. Now we come to verse 9. What is the fruit of the 144,000 sealed? Who is going to be saved in their preaching? The Bible tells us. Verse 9 says, After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. So Paul's right there. What was the phrase? Metatalta. See, you'll catch it all through Revelation. John sees the 144,000. He hears their number. He's blown away by it. And then metatalta after this. Now he sees the fruit of their ministry. Read it one more time, Caleb. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So don't miss that. Now, again, God has distinctive groups of people. The Jews, and what do we say? God means what he says. God says what he means. If it says sons of Israelites, it's the Jews. It's not Gentiles. It's not Mormons or Jehovah's Witness or this group or that group. It's most certainly not the church, the 24 elders. Who is it? It's the Jews. And who are they preaching to? They're preaching to the globe. Because who's this multitude that no man can number? They're out of every people. 
out of every nation, out of every language, out of every tribe. See, when the Bible speaks of nations, this gospel shall be preached to all nations. In our Western thinking, we think of our geographical borders. But when the Bible speaks of nations or tribes or peoples, the Greek there is ethnos. It means people groups. Amen. And when the people see this 144,000, they are going to fulfill that great prophecy of Jesus when this kingdom has been preached to all ethnos, to all peoples, then the end will come. They're going to fulfill that. And what's going to be the fruit? People out of every nation, out of every kindred, out of every tribe, out of every language. Amen? Amen. Go on. Sorry. Clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So again, notice the distinctive in chapter 4 when we meet the 24 elders. Now don't, don't miss this. If, if I were you, I would, I would draw a, a, a middle line and I would put uh, the elders and I would put uh, the tribulation saints who we're meeting right now. And I would note the contrast between the two. Remember in chapter 4, when we meet the elders, who I believe represents the church, because even in the church today, who represents the leadership of the church? Elders. Even in this church, we have an elder team. Our pastors are our elders. And when we meet the elders in chapter 4, they're, wi- they, they're wearing white robes, but everyone in heaven wears white robes. Because do you remember what the right, what, <laughs> white robes, I keep wanting to say right. Do you remember what the white robes represent? Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. They are the righteous deeds done, upon, done by the saints upon the earth. Do you remember what we keep saying about that scripture? You are threading your heavenly garments right now today. Can we say amen to that? Every time you feed the homeless, you're threading your white robes. Every time you help somebody in need, you're threading your white robes. Every time you do something in the name of Jesus for someone else, you are threading your white robes. And how well you're dressed up there will be how well you lived down here. Now, The elders are dressed in white. The tribulation saints are dressed in white. But what's the difference? The elders are crowned with golden crowns. You remember that? And see, there are crowns right now. You can win. There's the soul winner's crown, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of glory, the crown of life, and on and on and on. There's many crowns that you can win as a believer. But we don't see that with the tribulation saints. Remember, we have the golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. We don't see that. We see palm branches in the hands of these tribulation saints. And then the greatest distinction, and don't miss this. Well, let, let me let you get there, Caleb, and then I'll point it out. Keep, keep reading. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures... And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be (laughs) to our God. Remember what, what we keep saying? If you pay attention to the number seven, it's laced through the entire book. How many things did they just honor God with? Seven things. It's all over the book. Continue, please. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And listen to John's response. I said to him, Sir, you know. Now, isn't this interesting? Say amen if you're with me right now. Because you know I can't see you. (laughs) I don't know if you're bored or if you're with me right now. So I like it when when you amen here. (laughs) in chapter four when we meet the elders john knows exactly who they are there is no need for an explanation do you know why because john is part of the blood bought church he recognizes them but when we come to chapter seven 
and we meet this new group of people around the throne of God, why do you suppose John does not recognize them? And remember the pattern we said? Every time in Revelation that it speaks of events on the earth, who speaks of them? The four living creatures. But every time it speaks of events in heaven, who is speaking? One of the elders. And when one of these elders turned to John and says, Who are these? What does John say? Sir, you know. Why does John not recognize them? Because, friends, they're not the church of Jesus. They are the tribulation saints. And the Bible is going to tell us that. Go on, please. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So what did we say? God has distinctive sets of people. He has the Old Testament saints. He's got the New Testament church, which we are most privileged to be part of today. He's going to have tribulation saints. He has angels. He has the four living creatures. Don't mix these up. When you understand the distinctives, then you begin, the the puzzle pieces all begin to come together. Now, you and I are going to be watching this in heaven. And I want you to pay careful attention here. Who all is around the throne of God? In chapters 4 and 5, it's the angels, the 24 elders, which is the church. It's a representation meaning the church. A multitude that no man could number. And the four living creatures. Now who is around the throne of God? The angels, the 24 elders, the living creatures. And now these groups of, this group of people who the Bible says they've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They have come out of great tribulation. This is from the beginning of the tribulation. Remember the fifth seal, the martyrdom of God's people all the way through the end of the seven year period. This is a panoramic view. And here's what I want you to see. You and I are going to welcome these precious people around the throne of God. We're going to welcome them to worship our Lord and Savior, the Lamb of God. Amen. And what's so special. Now, we're going to get into this in the coming weeks. We're going to be in chapter 13, which is where the Antichrist goes from being a false peaceful leader to a ruthless world dictator. And he's going to enforce a mark. And I'm going to tie all this together in in just a few moments in chapter 14. Remember, God's going to seal his people, but so is Satan, with what chapter 13 calls the mark of the beast. Two different seals. We're going to see the Greek meaning of it. And we'll understand the contrast between the two. But here's what I want you to understand for this portion of scripture right here. The Bible says that if, if, someone, does, if someone does receive the mark of the beast on their right hand or their forehead. Which means allegiance to the beast. Allegiance to that antichrist. That pseudo Christ. He will forever shut the door on his salvation. He'll never be able to be saved. The Bible clearly states that. But for the ones that refuse to follow the beast, the ones that follow the Lord, the ones who are genuinely saved, oh, what a price that they will pay. And not only will they pay with their lives, and I'll show you that in chapter 13, verse 10, but here's what I want you to see. The Bible says in chapter 13, they will not buy, they will not sell, And they will not trade unless they have the mark. What you have to understand about these tribulation saints is that they are not able to go to the grocery store and buy food. They're not able to take a debit card. They're not able to order off of Amazon. (laughs) You don't have the mark. You're going to be public enemy number one. You're not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to buy clothing. You're not going to be able to buy a house or rent a place to live. You're not going to be able to own a vehicle. You're not going to be able to buy gas. And you know, I'm always amazed because there's some foolish people who say, you know what? So what if Christ comes? I'll get saved during the tribulation. Oh, friend, what you will face. What you will face. 
And here's what I want you to see in this portion of Scripture. They have witnessed the judgments. They have went through what we just studied last week. And remember, they cannot buy, they cannot sell, they cannot trade because they don't have the mark of the beast. And listen to what Scripture says about when they get to heaven. This is beautiful. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Next, please. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Mm. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their <laughs> eyes. Isn't that going to be something when we, the church, welcome our brothers and sisters who walked through the tribulation? And we'll watch God wipe away every tear out of their eye. Friends, we'll worship the Lamb like never before. Amen? Amen. So going back to Sadie's question last week. Will people be saved during the tribulation? Let me answer why some believe they won't. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we've referenced that several times in our series so far. Remember we said, don't waste your time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is because 2 Thessalonians 2 says, until the restrainer is removed, that man of lawlessness will not be revealed. We'll not know this side of heaven who the Antichrist is. And I'll get into the Antichrist. I'll explain to you everything I know about it. It's not everything to know, but it's everything I know. And I'll tell you every stitch of everything I know about what the Bible speaks of this man of perdition, this lawlessness one. But here is what I want you to see. In chapter 2, it says later on down in the chapter that God is going to send a strong wave of deception on the earth that people will follow the beast. So good brothers and sisters in the Lord, they read that and, and, and many interpret that to say if someone has rejected the gospel prior to Christ's coming, they cannot receive the Lord after the coming of Christ. Friends, I don't see that in that text. In my view, that's reading too far into that text. Now, will it be likely that some will follow me for a moment on this because many of you have lost loved ones. My concern is there'll be such a disillusionment, there'll be such a wave of deceit upon the earth that people will follow the Antichrist. Listen, if somebody won't follow Jesus now in this age of grace under the freedom that we have now. What is the likelihood that they will after the coming of Christ? Now, that will be for some, but I don't think for all. Clearly, by Revelation chapter 7, there's going to be so many people saved that John says it's a number that cannot be numbered. Let me tell you, after the rapture takes place, this church, along with every other church in this city, will be Packed to overflowing. You don't think your sons and daughters, you don't think your grandchildren that are without the Lord and they know you worship the Lord here at this church, you don't think this won't be the first place they come to? Because they'll know mom and dad were right. Grandma and grandpa were right. There was something to this thing called the gospel. And let me tell you, the Lord, I believe the Lord is going to lead us and I think the timing is spot on by the Holy Spirit. I think the reason why we are studying the book of Revelation right now, I love it when the Holy Spirit just connects dots because I'm not smart enough to connect dots like this. Our revival, which we call Revive, is in September. That's going to be at the tail end of this study of Revelation. And let me tell you what I believe our study in the book is going to do. It is going to bring a white, hot burden to our soul for our lost loved ones. 
And we're getting ready to mount a 10-foot cross over here by the baptistry. And on August the 8th, we are going to launch a campaign called 40 Days of Praying for Prodigals. And we're going to have you nail your prodigals to this cross. And let me tell you, church, for 40 days, we are going to intercede on their behalf. Amen? Amen. Why? Because we don't want our loved ones swept away in this wave of deceit. I'm going to, I'm going to do a special teaching, and I'm asking the Lord when this should be. But, you know, there's a thread in each section of end times. When you go to Matthew 24, and when you go to Thessalonians, and you go to 1 John, and you're in Revelation, all these scriptures that deal with the end time, there is one common thread throughout all of it. And do you know what it is? Don't be deceived. And let me share with you, precious friends, you and I are living in an age of deception. And I want to do a special series just on the deceptions of this day. And listen, many of our children, many of our grandchildren, many of our spouses, many of our neighbors, so many of the people that we love the most, they are swept away in these currents of deception. And it's our responsibility to call on the name of the Lord on their behalf. And we're going to set aside a special time of laser focus, concentrated, concentrated prayer, And consecrated fasting before the Lord for the prodigals in our life. And I believe all of this is right on time, right on target as we study this great book. Why? Because we don't want our children and we don't want our grandchildren. We don't want our loved ones to ever face this time that the Bible is predicting right now. Because if you're someone who foolishly is saying, "Huh, I'll follow Christ when I'm ready to follow Christ. Let me tell you, you'll face one of two things in the tribulation. You'll face one of two things. You'll either face the wave of deceit and you'll lose your soul forever. Or you're going to face persecution like you could have never dreamed. Caleb, take me to Revelation 13.10. And let me show you why you do not want to go through the seven-year tribulation period. And I would encourage all believers right now. To pray with me right now as we read this scripture. To pray for people that are not born again. People that are playing church. People that are having affairs. People that if Christ came today, you would be found in great sin. And your robes are not washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Let me tell you why you don't want to face this day. Let me tell you why you don't want to go through this tribulation. Oh, you, you may get serious afterward. You may escape that great wave of deceit. And you may follow Christ. But let me tell you what you'll face. Read it for me, Caleb. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Will God love people during the tribulation? Yes. As a matter of fact, he'll love them so much that he'll send 144,000 evangelists to them. Will God love them? Yes, so much. As we'll study in chapters 10 and 11, he'll send the two great witnesses to them. God will do everything he can to proclaim the eternal gospel even amidst such great judgment. But if you're born again, you and I will not be here. We'll be watching from the balconies of heaven. Amen. Amen. Now let's go to chapter 14. And let me begin to wind this down today. We're going to peek into chapter 14 to see what happens to the 144,000. We're going to get a little ahead of ourselves here. But remember, these are parentheses. The rapid fire succession of the tribulation is the seven seal judgments 
followed by a parenthesis. The curtain closes, and we meet the 144,000 sealed Jews and the suffering servants of God. Then the curtain goes back up, and then chapters 8 and 9, we're going to study the seven trumpet judgments. And I'm going to show you how that's judgment on climate change. And then the curtain is going to close again. And then we're going to have a long parenthesis. We're going to see the two great witnesses in 10 and 11. And then the curtain is going to close. And then the scene is going to shift again to heaven. And in chapter 12, we're going to see the real purpose of Israel in the end days. That's going to be fascinating. And then in chapter 13, we're going to see the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. And then here in chapter 14, we see the conclusion of the ministry of the 144,000. Now, this is very important that you understand. This is a panoramic view. We believe, scholars believe, that this is after the tribulation is concluded. Now, we still yet to study the bowls because what did we say? The curtain closes, a parenthesis happened. This is a chance to catch our breath. Then when the curtain goes up, then we'll see the last of the seven bold judgments. Now, we're going to see the outcome of the 144,000. And I'm going to give you just a few points to write down to help you understand the, the vital role that the 144,000 play. Caleb, if you'll take me from verse 1 on. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. (laughs) It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Mm. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Amen. They're going to sing a song that no one could learn. And who, who's watching? Did you see who's watching? The 24 elders, us. Can you imagine what it's going to be when we watch them sing that song? We're going to marvel at the grace of God. We're going to glorify God for his wisdom, for his protection. So who are these 144,000? Here's just a few quick things for you to note. Number one, these men, these are 144,000 men of each of the tribes of Israel. And note this, number one. They are purchased. The Bible says they have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The word redeemed there is ransom. That means to go to the marketplace to buy back. It literally means to purchase the same blood of Jesus that purchased you and I. It's the same blood that's going to purchase the 144,000 sealed. Isn't that remarkable? And God knows who every single one of them are. Number one, they are purchased. Number two, I want you to note, they are protected. They are protected. How? By the seal upon their forehead. Now, this is very interesting. There are two Greek words for seal that I want you to note. Number one, the seal that God does is called skargizo. What a fun word that is. Skargizo. You and I, five times in the New Testament, you should particularly look at Ephesians 1.13. That one's my favorite. Matter of fact, Caleb, if you will, turn to Ephesians 1.13 and read it for me. Five times in the New Testament, the Bible teaches that you and I, the New Testament church, we are sealed, scargizo, with the Holy Spirit. I hope I have that text right, Caleb. If it says something crazy, I don't have it right. You said 113, correct? Yeah. If it's like a genealogy or something, it's not right. (laughs) So-and-so beget so-and-so. No, that's not even in Ephesians. I'm kidding. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, 
were sealed with the promised <laughs> Holy Spirit. Amen. You were scargizoed. Go, go to lunch and tell the waitress, I'm scargizoed. No, don't do that. They'll think you're crazy. <laughs> we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The property of God is within us, the Holy Spirit. Well, God is going to put a seal on the forehead of these 144,000, scar gizo. Now, why is that important to differentiate the two seals? Because hear me, everything that God does that is authentic, Satan counterfeits. Everything. That's what the mark of the beast is. When you come to Revelation 13, in Revelation 7 and 14, the seal is scargizo, which is five other times in the Bible. But when you come to Revelation 13, speaking of the mark of the beast, it's not scargizo. It is karagma. I think that's right. Karagma. You'll have to fact check me on the pronunciation. I, I, kept, I told Sadie, I said, how am I going to word associate that? And she said, kureg. <laughs> karagma. I, I think it's karagma. Fact check me. But here's the point. Here's the point. They are vastly different. The Greek word karagma means a tattoo or an etching. And why will people receive it in their right hand or their forehead? We'll get into all of this in chapter 13. But listen, no one will receive the mark of the beast by accident. It is an allegiance to follow the Antichrist. But my point is, everything that God does authentically, Satan always counterfeits down to the ceiling of his people. Isn't that fascinating? They are, number one, purchased. They're ransomed. They're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Number two, they're protected by the seal of God. Number three, they are pure. The Bible says they're virgins. Now, some try to interpret this and say, oh, they didn't follow the corrupt political, they didn't, it's not corrupt religion. No, it says they did not defile themselves with women. Why? What's the point? The point is they're not going to be un, they're not going to be encumbered with normal life. They have a laser focus. They have a mission to complete on the earth. And they're going to be celibate. They're going to be marked by God. And they're going to be laser focused on their task. They are purchased, they are protected, they are pure. Number four, they're preserved. They endure through the entire tribulation. God supernaturally preserves them. Millions will be killed, millions will be slaughtered, but they, listen, who's standing on Mount Zion? Who made it all that? Not 139,999. Not 143,999. 144,000 made it. They're supernaturally preserved. And lastly, number five, they're preachers. Preachers of the gospel. Can people be saved in the tribulation? God in his grace. <laughs> David Jeremiah said it so well. What will the 144,000 be like? Imagine 144,000 Apostle Pauls on the earth. Imagine 144,000 Billy Grahams preaching at one time. Oh, the harvest. And where are we? We're around the throne of God cheering it on. And as those precious people enter heaven, we'll watch God wipe away every tear out of their eyes. And you and I will marvel. And we'll recognize the same blood that ransomed us has ransomed them. No wonder Ephesians 1 says that forever and ever, for all of eternity, God will display his glory in us. No wonder that 1 Peter says that angels long 
to look at our salvation. They're so intrigued. Are you that amazed at God's salvation? So what's your destiny? Should that trumpet blast today, will you be harpazoed? Will you be called up? Or will you face the wrath of the Lamb? What about your loved ones? Are you haphazard with them? Are you just, oh, they'll get serious when they get serious. Let them sow their wild oats. Are you interceding? Are you burdened? Are you fasting?